I am so honored to um, bring our very special guest to you and um, so honored for her to be here with us tonight. Dr. Barbara Williams Skinner. She is the CEO and co-founder of Skinner Leadership Institute and the co-convener of the National African American Clergy Network. It's a trusted advisor, public policy strategist, faith and community leader, author, lecturer, educator, executive coach, mentor, and bridge builder. She has made an indelible imprint in American public policy, government, diversity, and community relations. She and her late husband, Tom Skinner, founded the Congressional Black Caucus Foundation Prayer Breakfast that annually attracts over 3,000 leaders across the nation, many of them unchurched. Widely known as a commi committed prayer warrior, Dr. William Skinner regularly prays and with the congressional leaders and send daily scriptures to many of them. She serves as co-convener of the National African American Clergy Network of Denomination and Independent Church Leaders representing 15 million members. The Voting Rights, Criminal Justice Reform and Census for the 2020 election, the organization and nine state turnout Sunday lawyers and collars, voter Prep, uh, preparation campaign helped to ensure safe, free, and fair elections. Dr. William Skinners is co-founder of the Master Series for Distinguished Leaders, committed to producing high character and morally excellent millennial leaders on Capitol Hill and other places of power. The program is now in its 12th year and has graduated over 170 young leaders. Five years ago, she became the Master Series for Distinguished Clergy, clergy that equips pastors with advocacy and media training, teaching them how to voice their values in the public arena. Over 100 pastors have graduated from this unique program. Dr. William Skinner has recently authored a book on building personal spiritual power called I Prayed, Now What?, and a companion discussion guide that is popular among those seeking personal spiritual growth and group Bible studies. Dr. William Skinner holds a BA degree from San Francisco State University and a Master of Social Work degree and a law degree from UCLA, as well as a Master of Divinity and a Doctorate of Ministry from Howard University School of Divinity. It is my pleasure to introduce to you Dr. Barbara Went, Went, excuse me, Dr. Barbara Williams Skinner. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Well, thank you so much. Uh, good evening, uh, the NACP Salem Kaiser, Dr. Marilyn Williams, Pastor Mel Marilyn Williams. Yeah. Thank you so much for this invitation, Dr. Richardson. I've already enjoyed this program. I'm so inspired by these young people. I want them to all know that I am so proud of them. Uh, some, All of us have to remember a time when we were in their exact same place and it was somebody who lifted us up beyond our own um, vision of who we could be and, and put pour it into us, seed it into us. And so we're counting on you, let, let me just say that. Well, yeah. let, let me just suggest to you tonight that, that we are in a race, brothers and sisters, for the soul of our, of our nation, our democracy, and for the lives of, of black and brown people, of people of color in this country. Uh, in this past election, um, it, scared, it should scare some of us to know that we came within 5 million votes of returning leadership uh, of the most powerful office uh, in the free world uh, to someone who sympathizes with white supremacists and who now, even now, as we speak in this gathering, are att is attempting to destroy our democracy by turning back the votes of over 180 million people. Most of the votes are of those of African-American descent in Detroit and Atlanta and Milwaukee and Phoenix and brown people in, in Nevada, uh, in Philadelphia. Uh, this is what we are up against. 
we are also uh, up against the fact that a majority of white evangelicals and a majority of Catholics, of white women, Native American, 19 million black men and a substantial number of Native um, of, uh, Latino Americans voted for the status quo, even though it, it will endanger, it would have endangered even more the lives of black people. 97% of Americans who voted for the current administration believe that racism is not an issue at all. We need to wake up and be really clear about what time we are in tonight. Uh, they voted uh, for uh, the Affordable Care Act to be completely a, a repeal at a time when you, we all know that COVID is forcing us during Thanksgiving, not even to be with the ones we love the most, but that is the spirit of many in our country. Uh, so what, what are we, what is the time that we are in? We're in a race for the soul, as I said, of our nation, of our democracy, and for people who have been fighting all of their lives for the right for full humanity. And the Bible speaks consistently particularly in, from the writer of the, New, um, the majority of the New Testament, the Apostle Paul, about life as a race. Hebrew 12 says that we're surrounded by a mighty cloud of witness, so we should throw off everything that hinders us, uh, that everything that entangles us, and run with perseverance the race set before us. We have been, we're surrounded by Denmark Vesey and Frederick Douglass and Harriet Tubman and Fannie Lou Hamer and Ella Baker and John Lewis and the spirit of Michael Brown, Trayvon Market, Breonna Taylor, Freddie, Hain, Freddie, Freddie Gray and uh, Sandra Bland. I mean, the, the list goes on. And they, the spirit of these martyrs ha are encouraging us to stay in not a sprint, this is not a relay race, this is a long distance race. Because those who would turn back the clock are in it to win it for the distance. So let me just suggest to you tonight that there are four elements of this race for the soul of our nation, for the restoration of our democracy and for the full citizenship rights for people of color in this nation who are done dying. Number one, protest. The first element of any race, whether it's the National Olympics, the International Olympics, uh, Philadelphia, the famous Philadelphia relays that I love so much, and, or any international meet, is to qualify to get in the race. If you're in a 5K or 10K race, or you're in, the, uh, you're in, the long, you're in a race, whatever it is, you've got to get in it. And African Americans have been protesting to get in the race for full citizenship and equity for over 400 years. We, we, uh, we've been protesting since we the people to have all of the rights that everybody else had. And we have protested all the way through the 1965 voting rights 55 years ago only to be set back seven years ago by the Supreme Court to tell us that our voting rights are not really quite secure. 25 states decided uh, that they can suppress our vote. We, we have, we, we're in a race that we've got to be clear about, that we're not by ourselves, but we're in this race. If it is no, this is no afternoon contest. This is not a quick relay. This is a long distance race. Protest has got to become part of our, our cultural and our racial DNA. It's got to be part of what we do. And regretfully, it was the Black Lives Matter movement, not even rooted, the, probably the first movement not rooted in the Black church, not rooted in the church, that had to wake up the church about the criminal injustice system after Ferguson and the killing of Michael Brown and before that of Trayvon, Market, um, uh, Trayvon Martin that, that had to help us to know that this is not a race for young people. This is not a ra the race for the rest of us to sit back and criticize uh, the looters. And, and those. we want nonviolent protests to be sacred, so sacred 
that we of all races and backgrounds and ages and generations say, this is our race to praise God that we finally got in the race after the vicious public execution of George Floyd. It was up that reached a point in our gut that we nobody had to tell us that this was us. This was about us. This we had gone through Philando Castile and Tamir Reich and Eric Garner, but this was a race to the finish. This was a race that we had to win together. So I, I'm so grateful for the fact that the NACP that has long been in this race and 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 the uh, in the National Urban League and the Lawyers Committee for Civil Rights and our sororities and fraternities and yes, our faith community finally got in this race for full. And let me tell you that that is a race that Ecclesiastes reminds us doesn't belong to the swift nor the battle to the strong, but those who endure to the end. But we have to, number one, for, for us to be done dying, we've got to make protest part of our DNA. The second leg of the race for a long distance runners like those of us must be to move from protest to the polls. And yes, we had to do that. Many of us had not been out on that battlefield dealing with getting people to the polls since 2016 when this president won. We had gone from turnout under Barack Obama of 66% and we've fell back under voter suppression to below 60%. Black people, some decided that uh, because Obama was not in the race, we weren't even gonna be in it. And what we had is four years of literal hell. We have learned what it means to lose rights. We have learned that we are in a, we've been in, a, in an environment where it's okay to cage brown babies. It's okay to have a Muslim ban. It's okay to call African nation asshole country. It, that there are no filters anymore. The, any ordinary white person can come up to a black person or a Latino person at a Walmart and tell them to go back to a country when this is their country. That's what we're in right now. So we had to go to the polls and many of us in the turnout Sunday, lawyers and callers, our voter protection plan had to rally the black churches. We never done it before. We had to work in and, and with uh, across all these boundaries. Many of us had not worked in unity together. We could not do this. No one denomination or organization, we were up against formidable opponents. We had to, in order to be in a race, you have to know who your opponents are. And what we learned is that we weren't against people who just wanted to inconvenience us. They wanted us out of the race. And so we had to meet with secretaries of state. We had to have uh, lessons for our pastors on what is voter suppression? What does it look like? We had to make sure that our young Millennial pastors were involved. We had to go into our Zoom meetings on how do you vote the whole ballot, not just the top of the ticket, but for school board and sheriffs and attorneys generals and those who impact policing. Oh, we had to really get our act together. We had to go from protest to the polls and praise God, it got us over that finish line, but please do not settle down because even as we gather tonight, there are five states in which this president is attempting to turn back the clock. And we said that before this was over, that most of us have, part of winning the race is knowing your opponent. We have got to get past the idea of being surprised by the level of cruelty and evil of this opponent. The goal is for black people to have no rights, to go all the way back, to take away the last 50 years of our civil and human rights progress. So Habakkuk 2 tells us to write down the revelation, make it plain on tablets. We had to put a playbook together and we shared it with one another and praise God, the NACP and Urban League and the faith community worked together. We worked in nine states in Alabama and all of the, these large uh, battleground states. And I'm so grateful that we 
got our act together and we put together a playbook. And so we got over that part of the finish line. But oh, the race is hardly over. The enemy doesn't give up just like that. Nobody gives up power uh, without a demand. Frederick Douglass reminded us of that. And so unfortunately, African-Americans have long gone into a situation where we go and we vote and then we're done. So that's why we got to get to the third leg, leg of the race. We got to go from protest to the polls and from polls to policy. What, is, what do I mean by that? What I, I mean is that it is not enough to get people elected to office and then argue about what they didn't do two years or four years later. What we have to understand is that everybody we elected as taxpayers and citizens works for us. You are either at the table or you're on the menu. That's what we learn in Washington. And if you are on the menu, all your interests are being carved up by those who have no interest in your community. They may, may not even be hating on black people. You're just not on their mind. You're not in their priority. So we've had, we have to learn as African-Americans to hold all of those, everybody you voted for on November 3rd, even while you're fighting right now, to hold on to that vote, you've got to go back and you've got to remember what they promised and you've got to have meetings with them. You've got to gather and you've got to take the promises back to them and take the priorities of your community to them and say, this is what you promised and this is what we are holding you accountable for. Because public officials, they're not bad people, they're just busy and they go with whoever is in front of them. If money is in front of them, that's what they go with. But if numbers of voters are in front of them, that's what they also go with. So accountability is not something anybody owes us. Accountability is what we must get. So you've got to go from protest to the polls, from polls to policy. Policy means that once a person is in office, you've got to say to them, this is what healthcare disparity, this erase looks like. This is what the prison industrial population ended looks like. This is what bail reform looks like. So we don't have all of our people in jail when they could be out like people who have money. This is what it looks like to close the wealth gap. This is what it looks like to protect our black colleges and universities. In other words, policies are written by people who look like you and I. So stop thinking that you have to be an expert. You just have to be clear that they work for you. And then you have to find your experts. And we have them all through our community and say, how do we go into the meeting with the governor and the mayor and the city council? How do we go into the hearings and state our case? Because we really know our own case. No one can tell our story like we can tell our story. So you've got to go from protest to the polls, from the polls to policy. And finally, the fourth level of this race is power. Protest to the polls takes you to policy. You can shape the policy and still have no power. What does power look like? Power looks like the ability to decide the sheriff and the police chief so that we don't have to worry about being shot in the back and police getting off. Power looks like you decide who is on the school board because you take any one of our churches on our organizations. We have enough members in our sororities and our fraternities in NACP and our churches to decide. Many of these races are decided by very few votes. Power is right now deciding since we, many of us voted for uh, Joe Biden that we are now submitting resumes because we know who should be heading the education and the energy department and the housing department and all the others in the commerce department. Never count yourself out of the race or unqualified. Once you got in the race, you're in it just like everybody else. So why are we doing this? We're doing this because we have a generation that we're trying to leave a better world to. The reason I love what you are doing tonight is because you're telling the next generation is that at some point that we are in a relay. At some point, we we who are of a, the older generation, we got to hand off the baton to the next generation. We can't stay in this forever. 
So as we call out the names of Trayvon Martin and Tamir Rice and Michael Brown and, and, and Alton Sterling and so many others, let us remember that's why we're running this race. Paul says, I finished the race. I have passed my test. And now they're set up for me a crown of glory. We have not finished the race until we've equipped the next generation to know what it means to go from protests to the polls, from polls to policy shaping and making, and from policy shaping and making to power, where we are secretaries of state shaping and counting and deciding how to certify these races. We are the ones who are on the state boards who are confirming who won the election until we are commissioners who are deciding, until we are at the governor's office. That's when we can say we've done dying because we have done all we can do for the next generation. May God help us to fight a good fight, finish the race, and keep the faith. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen.